Get your business together. Get yourself into what you do and see it through. Being boss is hard. Blending work and life is messy. Making a dream job of your own isn't easy. But getting paid for it, becoming known for it, and finding purpose in it is so doable if you do the work. Being Boss is a podcast for creative entrepreneurs brought to you by Emily Thompson and Kathleen Shannon. Hi, I'm Emily, and I own Indie Shopography, where I help passionate entrepreneurs establish and grow their business online by helping them build brands that attract and websites that sell. I help my clients launch their business so they can do more of what they love and make money doing it. And I'm Kathleen. I'm the co-owner of Braid Creative, where I specialize in branding and business visioning for creative entrepreneurs who want to blend who they are with what they do, narrow in on their core genius, and shape their content so they can position themselves as experts to attract more dream clients. And Being Boss is a podcast where we're talking shop, giving you a peek behind the scenes of what it takes to build a business, interviewing other working creatives, and figuring it out as we go right there with you. Check out our archives at lovebeingboss.com. Hello and welcome to Being Boss, episode number 51, brought to you by FreshBooks Cloud Accounting. Today, we are talking to Carolyn Elliott, and you guys, I have been so excited for this one. I actually found Carolyn in our Being Boss Facebook group when she posted a link to an article that she wrote on Medium about all of her bizarre philosophies that helped her go from seriously broke to her first five-figure month being her own boss. And yeah, there's nothing I love more than like a rags to riches story. Actually, that's not true. We've been getting a lot of interview requests from like old white dudes who went from bankrupt to billionaire. And I'm like, I'm so not interested in that. But what I love about Carolyn is that she's also a total witch. And I don't mean that like bitch, but like witchy magic witch. (laughs) One of my mottos whenever it comes to running a creative business is that you track what you attract. So you guys might know about my chalkboard system for tracking my clients, but I also think that it works whenever it comes to your finances too. So I was recently coaching a creative who was a total mess about their finances and felt like they weren't making the money that they wanted to make. So I asked them a little bit more about how they were tracking their finances and they revealed that they're not at all. So I recommended FreshBooks immediately. It's so easy to use. It's so intuitive. You don't have to have a degree in financing or accounting to use FreshBooks. So I think that tracking your income and your expenses really just almost on a woo-woo level gets you in touch with your money in a way where you start attracting more of it. So try FreshBooks for free today. Go to freshbooks.com slash being boss and select being boss in the how did you hear about us section. Carolyn, welcome to being boss. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Emily, for having me. I'm delighted. So I should also clarify that you are in Bali. I am. Is that okay to share? Okay. So you're in Bali and it is 5.30 a.m. where you are. Yes, and the roosters are a crowing. So you yeah. guys hear roosters, like that's real deal. <laughs> yes, it is. Those are not manufactured rooster noises. They're for real. <laughs> All right, Carolyn, tell us about yourself. Sure thing. So I run virtual courses um, and I edit the magazine Bad Witches. So the courses that I teach are on writing for the social web and growing an online business. Uh, that course is called Thrill. And the other course that I teach is called Influence, which is a course on practical magic. So I also do some one-on-one work with people, but mostly these days my focus is on my courses. Um, I have a doctorate in critical and cultural studies from the University of Pittsburgh, where I taught poetry and writing for seven years. Um, I have a book called Awaken Your Genius, a seven-step guide to manifesting your Wait, to uncovering your creativity and manifesting your dreams. It's a hell of a subtitle. Um, <laughs> and boy, what else about me? Oh, I have a, I'm launching my own podcast in the middle of January with my friend Fu. It's called Super Connectors. 
It's all about connecting both in the sense of networking and also in the sense of like intimacy and heart to heart connection. So um, I've been interviewing folks for that and getting that into motion. Nice. Good. Oh, so, okay. I totally read your book. And I loved it. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. I um, It's been a while since I've completed a book. I'm, I'm one of those people that will like pick one up and read like half of it and then never pick it up again. But I kind of couldn't put this one down. And it was it was one, the most woo woo thing I've ever read in my entire life. And two, it may have been one of the most impactful things that I have ever read in my entire life. It was fantastic. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to let that soak in. <sighs> it was it, it it was so good. I I went through and I was just like going through all of my highlights and I think I highlighted maybe the entire book because I was going to try to pick out a couple of things to like, you know, read on air so that people can like get a taste of what it is and like I really highlighted the whole thing. <laughs> basically <laughs> so, so just read the book i know so yeah just go get it got it on kindle it was really great i over thanksgiving i just like i ate it up it was so fantastic and one of the things i know one of the things that i, I really wanted to talk to you about today and especially in terms of like the people that we have on the podcast or who listen to the podcast one of the things that you talk about um is really like your responsibility to own your art and to like own your creativity. And I would, I would just love to hear your just sort of general thoughts around that, especially in terms of people who struggle with living their creativity. Um, Go. Okay. (laughs) So for people who struggle with owning and embodying their creativity, if they're anything like me, for me, for years, it was about, trying to produce something that would be good enough for external accolades and thinking like, if I can't sit down and write a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, what's the use? I might as well just jump off a bridge. Now, some people like to say that like, oh, suffering genius, that's a myth. In my experience, it is not a myth. It is the realness. Like, I can suffer so hard and some of the most brilliant people I know are can get really, really miserable because we have this faculty within us, that the same faculty that could be employed to create wonderful things, we can also regularly employ it to create these nightmarish constrictions in our own minds. So um, what became really liberating for me was when I decided that the purpose of my creativity was not to win recognition or, you know, even entertain anybody, that the purpose of it was to create, um, sounds a little bit corny, but to create the world that I wanted to see. There's an author, a wonderful author, Charles Eisenstein, who's written a book called Sacred Economics, where he talks about the more beautiful world that we know in our hearts is possible. And to me, at its core, that's what my creativity thrives on. And this really, this idea solidified for me when I went one weekend, I'm not sure why, but I was in Baltimore. And in Baltimore, they have a museum called the American Museum of Visionary Art. And it's all of these, you know, amazing pieces by artists who are not mainstream, who are, you know, I think the non-politically correct term would be outsider artists. And the main theme in that work is always the return to the Garden of Eden, some kind of, it's, it's like a longing for restoration to wholeness is what repeats again and again. And some of these are like the most, I mean, talk about creative, like the creativity on display there is just like so prolific and so generous that it really, to my heart, to my mind, outshines, you know, the glossiest thing that the Metropolitan might be able to put up. So does that speak to your question, Emily? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I think that yes. (laughs) Well, and what what I want to point out is that I think that, and there's, okay, 
let me stay on one one mind track here. I think that sometimes creatives feel as if they're being selfish whenever they are being creative for themselves. And I think that's part of what owning it means is that you kind of have to get selfish, for a lack of better words, with your creativity. But I also see a link here towards creatives, especially women, being afraid to ask for money for their creativity and to be compensated for it. So I'd love to dig into that aspect of owning it, owning your creativity, creating for yourself and just being selfish with that. Who who cares, you know? And then also getting compensated for that as well whenever you're being creative for people that aren't yourself. <laughs> Beautiful set of questions there, Kathleen. And what that reminds me of is um, one of my... I think of him as a mentor, even though he died a long time before I was born. But Ralph Waldo Emerson um, wrote a lot about how if you are able to know what is the most true thing within your own soul, like the deepest down thing, that it would take lots of introspection, lots of selfish, indulgent self-discovery to uncover then you know what is most true in the souls of others. Because we are all, at a very fundamental level, uh, the same. And so that process, he called the process of discovering that poetry, um, which is a very, you know, very different than what most people think of when they think of poetry, but that's what he thought of. So if you can do that kind of research which is what artists do. Um, go in, like, pay attention to the most excruciating, exquisite, personal, emotional details. Find the unconceal the truth. And truth, this is where we get into another issue, which is that our culture, by and large, only understands the Latin idea of truth, which is veritas, which means truth as correspondence truth as verification, which is a wonderful thing and which, uh, you know, fuels all of our science and all of our technology. This idea of like, if we can test something and make it repeat in the same way and we can verify it, then we're good and that's what truth is. Yes, but that's actually just one tiny little facet of truth. The other form of truth, with our, which our culture has terribly neglected, is called, um, and I'm terrible at pronouncing Greek, so it's either... Aletheia or Aletheia, but it's A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. I I like to just say Aletheia because it's pretty. Um, (laughs) Is I I alternate between them. Um, That form of truth is truth as unconcealment. And the philosopher Heidegger talked about it a lot. Truth as unconcealment is not about you know, matching up this and that. Instead, it's about being alive to the unfolding presence that's happening. It's always shifting. It's always evolving. It's a resonance. It's a truth of resonance rather than a truth of um, verification. So that, to me, is the kind of truth that Emerson is talking about and the kind of truth that he valued more highly than scientific truth. He said this again and again, and it was a very unpopular idea when he was saying it in America in the 19th century, and it's still an unpopular idea, although I feel like it's about to become way more popular because we're reaching an epic level of messed up in our world, and that's becoming recognized. So... Um, so, so that's the piece about where there, there is no such thing, to my mind, as selfish creativity. It's impossible to have a selfish creativity because all creativity that may look selfish is a research along the way for this kind of profound level of truth. And when it comes to the market and selling our creativity, so what's really interesting to me is I grew up... Um, When I was a little Carolyn, I was very active in all kinds of uh, hippie, anarchist, far-out, weirdo scenes where, you know, the idea of selling your art was this, like, taboo, wicked, evil thing. And yet, at the same time, you know, we were all uh, 
really, really broke and miserable. So, uh, you know, part of my coming into adulthood was gradually realizing, like, okay, I may not like it, but I'm going to have to learn to live. I mean, we have a society based on commerce, based on the market. And there's a way in which, there's a wonderful book um, by Lewis Hyde called The Gift. And The Gift by Lewis Hyde and Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein are both really interesting in that they emphasize that the main economic difference in the war, in, how do I say this? that it isn't really a matter of capitalism versus socialism or communism, like we've been trained to think it is. The two radically different economic systems that exist would be capitalism versus gift economy, which is what most indigenous cultures, um, including European indigenous cultures, had. And Burning Man. And Burning Man, yeah, yeah, Burning Man, and and the Rainbow Gathering. I'm I've I've never been to a Burning Man, but I love the Rainbow Gathering because it's free. Because I could never afford a ticket to Burning Man. Now I could, totally could now. Um, <laughs> but the um, yeah, so gift economy is a wonderful thing, and I understand why my younger self and and the persistent, hardcore anarchists and hippies and anti-capitalists of the world really just want everything to be gift economy right now. We just like, hey man, why, why do we got to charge money? Like, why can't we just give it to each other? Like, yes, that is definitely, I think, you know, down the road where we need to be heading. But right now, this second, need to eat, need to pay rent, what are we going to do? So the thing is, the answer is that there's a level of commodification that we have to enter into. And um, what I like to do, what, and maybe many of your listeners out there, this might be less hard for them than it was for me. Maybe for them, maybe for some, it's just as difficult. For me, I like to get off on like the taboo wickedness of commodifying myself. Like to me, it's just so, oh, it's just like, the Cruella de Vil in me. Um, How can I get people to give me money? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not even Cruella de Vil. I'm trying to think of some better example of a, of a villainous capitalist. But, but yeah, it's pretty much. It's like I, I'm... There's, there's a way in which I don't like to sugarcoat it. I don't like to make it like, oh, this is all fluffy bunnies and money is just green energy and it, uh, it's so we just exchange it. It's so neutral. Like, hell no, it's not neutral. Like, there's, a, you know, a wealth inequality happening right now that has not been seen since the pharaohs were making slaves, you know, build their pyramids. Like... It's insane, and being involved in it necessarily involves, you know, you're getting your hands dirty. Like, I'm getting my hands dirty by participating in this capitalist economy. I've just stopped fetishizing having clean hands. Boom! Right? <laughs> Drop the mic. I, I'm i so um, challenged by you saying this. Whenever I quit my job working for someone else where someone else was giving me a paycheck and I didn't have to think about money as much or what it is, the way that I was able to, I don't know, come to terms with it on my own was thinking of money as energy. It was the way that I was able to charge more because I knew that I was putting a lot of energy into what I was doing. And, um, but I'm, I'm challenged by what you're saying and I think it's really interesting and I want to dig in a little bit more. One of the things that also helps me think about money and the exchange of money and, and versus the gift economy, which I'm also incredibly fascinated by. Um, I, you know, I didn't even know that Burning Man was a gift economy until a few years ago. My friend Star St. Germain, do you know Star? I feel like you guys should be friends. Anyway, she is uh, just wild and fabulous and a genius and uh, she's just a very colorful person. Anyway, she was telling me all about Burning Man, and I was so intrigued. But at this point, for me, it gets so it would become so exhausting to keep track of all the gifts back and forth, and really just putting a number to what's being exchanged really simplifies it in a lot of ways. So, for example, Emily and I do a lot of work together and with each other. 
we're trading thousands of dollars every month. We could just trade the services, but we don't want to keep track. It's easier to keep track of the money a lot of times. So I think also, anyway, but I loved what you said about not fetishizing it and just being willing to get your hands dirty. So do you still inherently believe that money is bad? <laughs> well, I I do. Um, let me put it this way. Um, so I think it's pretty clear, um, at least from the sources that I've read. So for example, there's a book called Debt, The First 5,000 Years, um, which makes this case in a very compelling way, as does the Lewis Hyde book I mentioned and the Charles Eisenstein, which is that money is based on debt. Currency, as we currently have it, is based on debt. Literally, when the United States Federal Reserve wants to create more money, for example, they put a little digit in a debt ledger and um, the dollar is issued and the dollar is represented in the ledgers as, you know, like, what is it? Like, I don't even know, like minus 1.1 or something. Like, it's, it's the dollar plus a little bit of interest. So there's always this tug of interest in currency and every fiat currency around the world um, is like this. So the dollars aren't uniquely evil. <laughs> Not evil. I don't, I'm still used... I'm just saying, I'm just talking about debt. So the um, so we live in a society that really uh, revolves around debt. And Lewis Hyde and Charles Eisenstein make this really interesting argument, which is that the way that our currency is does not reflect how value is created in the natural world, right? So if... Um, so while currency is wonderful for exactly the reason you mentioned that it can be so simple to just put a number on something rather than to like try to worry about you know what's happening with services one example i'm i'm pretty sure i'm remembering correctly from charles eisenstein is he talks about uh let's say i have a pile of cabbages um those cabbages are not going to accrue in value the longer i hold on to them however money if I put it, you know, in some sort of compound interest, something or other, will accrue interest. It will grow in value the longer I sit on it and hoard it, because that's how it works. Cabbages don't work that way. They will rot unless I put them into circulation. So there's a way in which debt-based currency is bad in the sense that there's a built-in encouragement to hoard. Now, like folks like you and me, we don't really tend to necessarily have the luxury of uh, hoarding vast amounts of capital because we are actively creating and we are actively investing and putting our cash into circulation. And I would say that the spirit of cash, like this, you know, whatever we might say is, um, you know, the, the good spirit of cash or money, which I like to think of as Hermes or Mercury or um, this kind of like sexy messenger god of commerce and thievery um he likes to move he likes to go 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 so something that i think is contrary to that good spirit is the hoarding that we see in at a large scale you know families like uh and not like i'm innocent of having shopped at walmart i've shopped at walmart plenty in my life but the walton family i mean they control like <laughs> i don't even know what the percentage is it's like some like gut level shocking percentage of the wealth in America, like most of it. One family, that's an oligarchy. So there's, um, oh man, and Donald Trump is a serious candidate for the president? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to talk about is that. Is this why you live in <laughs> Bali? <laughs> right? I may come there too. <laughs> this is part of it. I mean, it's, I don't, yeah. Anyways, Oligarchy, so which means rule by the wealthy. That's what we have. We don't have a democracy. We haven't had a democracy for a long time. I mean, Thomas Jefferson cautioned about this. A few of the other founding father type dudes were like, hey, guys, I, I hope everybody realizes, like, if we let these corporations take over everything. And I think corporations do awesome things in many contexts. Like, there's many corporations that my life depends on, like, you know, Apple, Google, that sort of thing. So I, once again, hands not clean here. Uh, 
but we have a society that's ruled by them, and I don't know how well that's going. But um, I think there was a question I was supposed to be answering. <laughs> You know what? It's 5.30 in the morning. I didn't mean to get into a discussion about economics. Let's rewind because money was like my eighth question for you. Oh, okay. Let's, let's rewind a little bit. And I want to ask you kind of how do you define magic and what does it mean like to be a witch? Tell us about that side of things. Oh, yes. So these are my favorite questions. I know. And this is what I really want to be talking about. Not money so much, (laughs) but we had to go there a little bit. Yeah. So maybe I can weave back something more sensible about money eventually, but about magic and witchcraft. So the way that I think about magic most often lately, and there's many ways that I've explained it and many ways that I will explain it probably in the future, But what seems most relevant to me right now is that magic is a lot like lucid dreaming. So if you read any book on how to have lucid dreams, you will see that, uh, number one, the hard part is getting lucid in the first place. Once you are able to reliably um, realize that you are dreaming while you're dreaming, Everything else will happen. You can, you know, it's, that's really the hard part. Unless you get so excited you wake up. Well, right. So that takes practice too, right? So you, you, you learn how to get lucid in your dreams, and the first ten times you're like, I'm lucid, I'm so cool, and then you wake up. But, you know, eventually you practice over time, and you become lucid in your dreams. And so... This, um, because a lot of times when people are asking me about magic and witchcraft, they're asking me specifically about uh, spells. So the analogy that I like to give for spells in this lucid dreaming analogy is, um, let's say that you become awesome at getting lucid in your dreams, and you want to fly. So being in your dream and just saying to yourself, I want to fly now. Like, you would think that would work. Why wouldn't that work? Like, it's your dream. Everything's in your mind. Like, you should just be able to fly, right? But actually, it doesn't work like that. And any lucid dream manual will tell you, if you are lucid in a dream and you want to fly, you need to start flapping your wings and running. Yeah, I mean, flapping your arms and running. Because that's, uh, you know, that signals to your dreaming mind flying, taking off, being like a bird. So obviously that is a, um, that's a physical sensory action within your dream. That's not just thinking the thought, I want to fly now. That's like flapping my arms, running, being, pretending I'm an airplane or a bird, and then I start to fly. So that's actually what spells are. They are symbolic, physical, sensory actions that initiate um, a sequence within so our daily life I like to call it the waking dream so the waking dream um, is moves slower than the nighttime dream and in the waking dream right if I uh, we have these things called like uh, physical laws or something um, I've never <laughs> been that? I don't know I've never been that tuned into them but they they exist and magic, so, so what we were talking about with the lucid dream, flying in a lucid dream, that's a form of magic. Uh, you know, Aleister Crowley's famous definition of magic is um, making something happen, what is it, the art and science of making reality conform to your will, I think is what good old Uncle Crowley liked to say about magic. So that flapping your wings in a dream counts. So in, in this waking dream, when I perform a spell... When I, uh, let's see, what's a good one that I did? Oh, so I do financial sorcery, speaking of money. Um, There's a great book by a wonderful man named Jason Miller called Financial Sorcery. I think that everybody should read it who's interested in witchy stuff. And in it, he talks about cultivating a relationship with the god Jupiter. Um... And anyways, there's like sigils and there's invocations. So I was taking a cue from him and doing some of this work. 
So all of that work and all of the invocation and all of the candles and all of the offerings and the incense and all of that is just like flapping my wings inside a nighttime dream and signaling that I'm ready to fly now. Except in this waking dream, it happens via synchronicity rather than instantaneous results. So there's no way to prove that magic works because it can all be coincidence because synchronicity is a subjective sense of, of meaning, of, of aleth- aletheia, of truth as unconcealment. So in synchronicity, I realize that something in the outside world lines up with something in my internal psychic world. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, because as you may have started to realize since I've been talking about the waking dream and the nighttime dream, is there is no internal and external. And that's what magic, the practice of magic um, in the, you know, whatever I guess we would call it the Western tradition, leads to is the experience of non-duality. So all all spiritual paths uh, lead eventually to this place of non-dual experience, right? So like yoga talks about it, tantra talks about it, um, you know, the mystical sides of Christianity, Sufism, everything will all eventually circle round to a profound realization of non-duality. And they'll talk about it in different terms, but that's pretty much what it is. So the path of magic reaches the realization of non-duality through uh, the cultivation of desire rather than the suppression of it, which is really cool and is really a lot more suited to our... uh, I wish there were better words for it. There have to be better words for it because every time I say Western, I think of all of the Japanese people I know who are way more Western than me with their cell phones. But anyways, uh, there's <laughs> um, different than, than Hinduism or Buddhism, although both Hinduism and Buddhism have uh, tantric dimensions, which actually resonate and align very much with what I'm talking about, which is alchemy. So a big influence on me and my work, my witchcraft. So sometimes people ask me like, oh, you're a witch, are you a Wiccan? It's like, I am not. I'm not a Wiccan. Um, Wiccanism is neat. And my stuff, what I do, is very strongly influenced by Renaissance Italian hermeticism, by American folk magic, uh, and by Tibetan Tantra. I'm technically... So then, would that be, like, eclectic, or...? I call it pragmatic Hey bosses, did you have a case of FOMO? That stands for the fear of missing out. When you saw all the Being Boss magic go down for our Being Boss vacation in New Orleans. Fear not friends, because we are planning another boss vacation this spring in Miami. Miami. (laughs) So it was really hard to figure out what location to go to, but we've never been to Miami. And the reason why we do these boss vacations is to cultivate our creative pack see different parts of the world, get some face time with each other, connect with each other, and live the boss life. So to learn more details about this boss vacation, just go to lovebeingboss.com slash Miami. We hope to see you there. So, okay, so this is a question too, because as some people I think are a little more witchy than they would ever let on to being, so do you feel like like it's a, you know, in a lot of different religions, okay, well, one is being a witch, is that a religion? Can you be a Christian and be a witch? Can you be a Buddhist and be a witch? Oh, I love like, this. Let's talk about that a little bit. Oh. And I also, <laughs> so good. like, you have to be, like, initiated to be a witch. Can you be a self-proclaimed witch? Can you own that? Oh, hell, oh, hells, yeah, let's talk about this. Oh, this is so good. Okay, I love this. So in my worldview, absolutely, yes to all of that. You can be a Christian and a witch. You can be a Buddhist and a witch. Uh, To my mind, the way that I generally think of it is witchiness, 
uh, is sort of like an inherent quality. And I don't necessarily mean that as like, it's not like a, a bloodline or something uh, mysterious like that. But it's sort of actually when I hmm, try to get concise with this, a witch is basically a person, very often a woman, who is not controlled by the patriarchy, who is uh, free thinking, free creating, um, exercising her power, including her feminine sexual power and her power with symbols and you know these rituals, whether or not they're whether or not this. I'll just say she, whether or not she calls them magic. So for example, to my mind, there's a few like world's greatest witches. Among them is Jesus. Like Jesus was so witchy. He turned water into wine. He was always keeping the party going and he was hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors and just basically doing weird magic stuff all the time to the point that they had to burn him at the stake, uh, crucify him. So... There's Jesus. And then another big time favorite of mine is Queen Elizabeth I. So Queen Elizabeth, not so, and I mean, you know, she was the lady who was queen uh, during Shakespeare's time, right? She ruled over England at probably the most, her rule, her rulership, I would argue, uh, was what created the conditions for the Renaissance in England. And she took power not with a big military force. She hardly had any military force. She had a claim to the throne, and uh, she had a few friends who she organized into a spy network, and she disseminated images of herself, portraits of herself, as the fairy queen, Titania. So the fairy queen, Titania, was a mythic figure, right, in the English imagination. Um, And by identifying herself with the fairy queen... In the minds of the people, she became that and gained power. So that's a spell right there. Like, and and I mean, oh boy, I mean, all of modern advertising is spellcraft. (laughs) It's not necessarily for the best, but, you know, it is. So she totally cast a spell. And also when people would come to address her, there was a rule. You could not address her as just like... um, Dear Queen Elizabeth, uh, this is what's happening right now in the realm. No, you had to be like, Oh, Queen Elizabeth, ruler of the fairy worlds, empress of my heart, to whom I light up with joy every time I see, I must tell you there is a tax collection happening this Wednesday. Like, you know, she used language and image and art in such a way that that's where her power came from. So then she was able to rule the nation with just a spy network and not a police state, not a, um, you know, and you know, in Elizabethan England, it was pretty much anarchy. It was like, there weren't any, like the main laws were, well, pay your taxes and don't kill the queen. Um, but anything else you could get away with, but (laughs) So she was a great witch, and she would never have called herself a witch, you know, she would have thought of herself as something else. So when I talk about somebody being witchy, what I'm really talking about is this, oh, and other definition to weave in here, also a witch to me is somebody who is has integrated and owned and become okay with their shadow side who is not fetishizing having clean hands, who is not trying to be some ideal of something or other, but is fully incarnating, fully being present in her body right here, right now, owning, being boss. Like, uh, somebody who's not witchy is somebody who's scared of those darker drives, sex, anger, power, and, you know, integrating them doesn't mean that, like, you, you're ruled by them. It just means, it actually means quite the opposite. A lot of people who want to be all, like, light and love and fluffy bunnies, like, I'm terrified of them because they're, and I used to be one of them myself, they'll, you know, they'll kill you as soon as look at you. Like, they're not in control of their, you know, dark sides. So they're repressing them, which means they're all the more dangerous. So somebody who's owning, acknowledging, taking responsibility for 
those darker primal impulses is a lot more trustworthy, a lot more congruent, um, and a lot more, you know, powerful in general. So, uh, there's plenty of people in this world who call themselves witches and God bless them. Uh, perhaps they are, I'm not the ultimate arbiter of everything, but to my, you know, just my visceral reaction, I'm like, Oh honey, I don't, I don't think you're there yet. You know, like they're, so it's, to me, it's not really a religious title. It's more like a way of being in the world. Which is being boss. Exactly. Precisely. <laughs> We're pretty much leading a gaggle of witches now, I think, is what it is. Yeah, that's, that's all. That's just what I wanted to make clear. That's, yes, ex- precisely. <laughs> One of the things that I got from your article, which blew my mind, I basically shared it with everyone I know. But <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I also have to tell you how it is that Kathleen came across this. So I saw the article you posted it in the Being Boss Facebook group, and we'll include a link to it in the show notes for sure. But um. I texted it to Kathleen. It was like, I don't know, like eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, like something kind of ridiculous. I don't usually bother Kathleen at this time. And I texted her this and I was like, I can't tell if this is complete bullshit or the greatest thing I have ever read. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> And I was like, because no, it it's was the amazing. best thing you've ever read. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, good. I thought so. It was like, it was amazing. Anyway, okay, continue with well, what you were saying. Well, one Kathleen. of the things <laughs> <laughs> I think um, one of the things that you mentioned in there that is one of the best tools that you can employ, especially as a boss, is attention. Like attention is everything, and that if you can give people your attention, you can cast a spell on them. Essentially, I mean. Ethics aside, but (laughs) (laughs) that's how it works. That's sheerly how it works. So I love that you bring it back to attention. And um, yeah, in my experience, that's exactly what it is. So a witch has liberated her attention to a large degree from her cultural conditioning that tells her to, you know, be good, be nice, be pretty, don't offend. So she's takes. So those are all attention drains. Like, as long as your attention is on your conditioning, it's being drained and you're being weakened, right? So when you've liberated your attention and other, you know, attachment and aversion are drains in general on attention. So, um, boy, that would take a long time to really go into, but, uh, (laughs) but, but our culture is built around attachment and aversion. It's built around getting obsessed with things and trying to avoid, you know, other things. Um, so instead that approach, like you're talking about Kathleen, like just being, you know, free attention, having that liberated energy to put on to people and to put on to projects, that is the very essence of witchiness because liberated attention feels so good. Like I'm receiving attention right now from Kathleen and Emily. I will testify you folks out there. It feels awesome. And, you know, that's, that's some witchiness, pure and simple, is being able to light somebody or something up just by putting your attention on them. That's, that's it. That's what it's about. Um, and the thought occurred to me, Kathleen, that I have a way to tie this into what you were asking earlier about money that's maybe a bit more concise, which is just that, um, so money as debt represents, to my mind, uh, sort of resentment, resentment, grief, holding on to something, not forgiving something. Um, And when people like my younger self are so uh, afraid to, you know, deal in money and get paid appropriately and whatever, I think part of that is a recognition of like, hey, this, this has like some heavy weight to it. This has baggage to it. And part of the process of getting okay with charging what I'm worth and and all of that has to do with me getting okay with um, having a human soul that has grief, that has resentment, that has these layers in it. And when I'm willing to work with those things in my soul, I'm willing to work with money in the world. Mm. Does that make a bit of sense? Okay, here's what I want to talk about. Let's make it deep. I want to talk about liberation and attachment and 
that relationship to desire. So this is what... <laughs> This is what I struggle with. I want to be liberated. I want to be unattached. But God damn, I want some things bad, you know? So uh, tell me, what do I do? (laughs) Yes, ma'am. So the wonderful thing is that, so in a lot of um, initial bad translations of Buddhist sutras and tantras, uh, folks translated Um, the Buddha is saying, you know, you need to be free from all attachments and aversions as you need to be free from all desires and aversions. And that's not, that's simply not what was being said. So the energy of desire, the energy of like longing, that's Eros. Eros makes the world go round. Like Eros in a wonderful way, uh, you know, that's, um, talk about the essence of magic. That's, um, the Renaissance magician, uh, Giordano Bruno called Eros, called Desire, the, what is it, the vincula vinculorum, which means the bond of bonds, which means it's a, it's a bond that's so strong that it confines all other bonds. It breaks all other bonds. So real authentic desire is the path to being a fr- free from attachment, actually. So, um, and the key to that which I'm constantly working on mastering myself, which is maybe a lifelong project to master, is learning to enjoy the sheer feeling of desire without grasping at the end of it. So the grasping part, yeah, is this is making sense? Probably? I'm like, preach, preach. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, those are the words that really get me going. You guys now. like, my my arms are in the air because I wish you could literally two days ago, we were talking to Paul Jarvis and Jason Zook, and I was like, I just want to enjoy the process. And it's everything that you're talking about right now is enjoying the desire and not being so attached to that outcome. Oh, hell yeah. So talking about our messed up culture, um, we have a culture that grasps for the end, for climax, for male climax, actually, is what our culture is based on. It's based on this paradigm of let's like go, 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 have a big money shot, and then we'll be done and we can roll over and go to sleep. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and it's actually a drive towards numbness, and it's a drive towards, um, I, I call it the, the Thanatos drive, the death drive is this, you know, we want to be numb, we want to, I mean, overeating, undereating, taking drugs, what, all of the things, I mean, every, every vice that you can associate with America has to do with um, reaching numbness, so that we don't have to feel desire, so that we don't have to feel the sensation of eros, of being alive, of being attracted. Um, and so Thanatos, death, numbness, that's all great. We definitely need death um, in order to have life, so awesome. However, the exaggerated emphasis on that money shot has like skewed everything terribly. So Eros is life. Desire is life. And um, talking again about Western mysticism, if you read the foundation, one of the foundational texts of Western philosophy is Plato's Symposium. So in Plato's Symposium, a bunch of old Greek guys are drunk and they're going around debating about the nature of love and what is love and what what is it for. And they finally, they get to Socrates and everybody's like talking about soulmates and, you know, nice stuff like that. And they get to Socrates and they're like, Socrates, what about you? You're the wisest man in Athens what do you think the nature of love is? And he's like, well, actually, I don't know anything about it, so all I can do is quote my teacher, the courtesan, the witch, Diatima, and I'll tell you what Diatima told me. And so he just quotes Diatima for his whole monologue. And the essence of what she has to say is that um, love is eros, and eros evolves from eros for a particular person to eros to the beauty in all people to eros and the beauty in all things finally it evolves to eros desire for the beauty that is not beautiful and is not ugly that pervades everything 
which, you know, I think you could also say is the Tao. So desire for the Tao, desire for the way of things as they are, and the beauty that is not beautiful and is not ugly, that permeates them at all times. If you can get there, uh, well, you know, you're enlightened, and everything's (laughs) awesome because you're in love with reality exactly as it is, and you're experiencing all this sensation and all this desire and all this love for everything right here right now so you're never um you know we i think our culture has a way of like making you know attachment is anxious and desire is not like desire is voluptuous and full and rich and nurturing whereas attachment is like graspy and uptight and starved actually yeah it kind of sounds like the difference between um anxiety and worry and anticipation and hope Looking like a boss is half the battle, right? We all want the most professional looking websites, email newsletters, feedback forms, and email signatures. But how is your scheduling software? I've been around the block and tried them all, and there's nothing more embarrassing than having a potential client email you because they can't figure out how to schedule a meeting. The last time that happened, I decided to resort back to the old format of comparing calendars and email chains, which is a bit of a nightmare, but more professional than using software that makes you look online incompetent. That is until we began using Acuity Scheduling. Not only is it easy for us to use, but it's easy for my clients to use as well. We use it for potential clients as well as current clients and even old pals who just want some FaceTime. And the user interface has ensured that I haven't gotten a single other email from a cool creative who can't figure out how to get on my calendar. Schedule clients without sacrificing your soul. Sign up for your free 60-day trial of scheduling sanity at acuityscheduling.com slash beingboss. Now let's get back at it. Emily, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm soaking it in. <laughs> As <laughs> usual. <laughs> I can talk to you for another hour. I mean, you're going to have to come back on the show. Is that okay? That would be <laughs> super okay. You are our new boss girlfriend. <laughs> Basically. Yay! <laughs> I could really talk to you forever about this. Um. Okay. I had on my list embracing the stuff you don't like, which we just talked about. One of the things that you said, there are a couple more things. But one of the things that you said in this article that I'm obsessed with, and I'm going to read your book. I lost my Kindle cord, and so it was dead. (laughs) Anyway, um, I found it. That's happening. But one of the things that you said in your article, which again we'll link to in our show notes, is that having is evidence of wanting. And... I love that so much because I think for better or worse, you are entirely responsible for what you bring into your life. And I hate saying that whenever, um, you know, my friends are going through a bad breakup or attracting toxic people in their lives. But I think in general, just taking responsibility for what's going on is huge. And that's what I really get out of having is evidence of wanting. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, I would love to. So a few prominent examples of this just from my own life. Um, So when I was like below the poverty level poor, like sleeping on my friend's couches, standing in line in the freezing cold at the food bank because I was like, didn't want to call up my mom and beg her to feed me. You know, I didn't want her to know how bad it was. Uh, I thought that I didn't like that. I thought, oh, this is humiliating. This is terrible. I'm like, you know, this. I'm too old for this. How can this be happening? How did I mess up my life this much? Like, what's the matter with me? You know, this big tirade of, like, why this sucks. And one day I started playing with this idea. What if my having this poverty really was evidence of the fact that a part of me, an unconscious part of me, not the part of me that I usually identify with, but some part of me freaking loves this, loves it. 
And like that idea was just so weird. It just it became fascinating to me and I began to play with it. And I, eventually I noticed that when I was willing to step outside of who I usually think I am and become open to the idea of myself as this larger being who includes these shadowy dimensions, including dimensions that, that love terrible things, I found indeed there was a part of me that loved the drama loved the romance of my poverty, loved having people rescue me, loved, you know, just every oh, humiliating second of it was like reaffirming that it was me against a cruel, cold world, you know, all of these things. And I'm not, and obviously there's also systematic uh, oppressive reasons why I was experiencing poverty, right? Like, um, I my skills are in in many ways very feminine skills, which are devalued by our patriarchal world. So you know, there's a, like on and on. There's no way to separate me from the rest of everything that's happening. So I don't know. This is where it gets sticky. Like, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. I'm just saying if you want to have a really interesting trip and possibly completely rearrange your experience of the dream that you call your life, try experimenting with this idea. So another place where I'm experimenting with this idea with like right now for myself, where it's it's less clear, and you know, and all of the people that I work with magically know this about me, is I'm pretty good on my money manifestation magic now. I still suck in my love magic. Like I my history of boyfriends is you know, my mother calls it the many loves of Carol and Elliot. Like, it's this uh, rather flamboyant track record of something or other. And, you know, I have this part of me that still longs for partnership and longs to, you know, realize that. So when I have an experience with a guy that I'm seeing or that I'm attracted to or whatever and it's not going the way that I think I want it to go, I'm in this constant investigation of like, what part of me secretly loves this? Like, loves this ambiguity, loves this lack of emotional vulnerability, loves this weird, addictive, controlling dynamic. What is it? And, you know, I haven't res like, completely arrived at the ultimate answer yet, probably because when I do, I will become enlightened. And this is another thing that my mother says to me, which is like, don't become perfect yet, Care, you might ascend to heaven. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's hilarious. My mom is like, well, she's a rough and t she's a Pittsburgh girl all the way. And she has these funny sayings. But anyways, my mom um, <laughs> helps me through this. And someday I'll figure it out, like, because I truly, I do, I passionately believe that this is true, that even though con my conscious mind thinks, no, I want my true love to be here with me right now, like, I want the guy that I'm attracted to to be completely all about me. Like, yes, my ego does, but a part of me wants him to, like, continue to reject me in various subtle ways forever. That would, that's what I really want. <laughs> You know, I had a similar experience. Um, anyone who listens to the podcast regular, regularly knows that I didn't sleep for all of 2014 because my baby was up every 45 minutes. And at some point I thought, what? Like, I hated it. I was miserable. And I thought, but what part of me loves this? And what part of me is allowing myself to continue to talk about it on a podcast, you know? And it is interesting and also kind of harsh to question yourself in that light. But I have to share this story with you guys because I did a sleep spell on my little homeboy the other day. I don't know if it's <laughs> ethical or not. And I had not been doing it for a long time because I was worried about the ethics of it or that I would maybe be opening him up to something that, I mean, he's just a baby, but I did this kind of, so what I did is I just protected his space. So not him directly, but I protected his space and charged it with sweet dreams and white light. He slept through the night, the first night I did it. So talk about like evidence and truth. It's my new truth. 
I wouldn't say new. It's my truth. <laughs> but it is cool to be affirmed in that way and then so immediately. It's awesome. Very awesome. Excellent. And then another um, instant of kind of like <laughs> – I, I hesitate to say witchiness for people who might not feel entirely comfortable with that, but I've talked a lot about the chalkboard method on the podcast. Oh, yes. And that is making space. And so that's what my coach, Jay Pryor, taught me. Um, he's a total witch. I was telling you about him. You'll have to listen to his episode. Anyway, um, is creating space for these dream clients, right? And someone on the Facebook group was like, Hey, how do I actually fill my chalkboard? You know, and they, she put chalkboard in quotes. And I go, Have you made your chalkboard yet? And she's <laughs> like, Oh, good point. <laughs> and it is that, <laughs> it is that thing that you're talking about of like doing physical. And whenever I was protecting my baby's face, like I thought a lot, like I meditated a lot on let's all just sleep. I prayed. But then whenever I actually made a bubble and brought down some light and kind of like washed out the space physically, that's whenever it started to happen. And so the same thing with the ch chalkboard. So I guess I want to talk about like maybe even other little spells or routines that people could do. You don't need to go out and buy a broomstick or a cauldron, even though I'm so down with all that stuff. But... <laughs> But what are some things that people can do? What, what is some practical magic that some bosses can start to employ in their business and their lives? Oh, wonderful question. So when I think about uh, practical magic, I always think about hoodoo, which is American folk magic, uh, African-American based, but with influences from European magic and hermetic Renaissance magic woven in there. Um, and something that's really popular in hoodoo, oh, oh, by the way, if you're interested, uh, there's a wonderful website called the Lucky Mojo Curio Company, run by a woman named Catherine, I think I'm going to pronounce it correctly, Kat Irinwode. And there's an awesome podcast called like the Lucky Mojo Hoodoo Hour, um, <clears throat> where she talks about stuff and I love to listen to it. I get the Are same. Are you writing that down, Emily? I'm, I'm pulling it up right now because okay. I wanted to remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I get the same joy out of listening to that that I think most people do out of NPR. It like soothes me, it comforts me. But anyways, um, there's some uh, fundamental things. So I think I loved what you emphasized, Kathleen, about the physical dimension of it. So I love visualization and all that meditation stuff too. But the physical dimension of it really anchors your, your magic in the physical world. And having anchors, if you know, is so important for that. And when I finally began doing that, just like you said, your experience with your baby, being able to put him to sleep so much more readily, when I incorporated physical materials into my wealth magic, hot damn, it sure worked a lot faster than all of my vision boards ever had. So um, some one basic practice that I might encourage would be the practice of uh, cleaning, cleaning with uh, magical washes. So putting specific herbs for specific magical intentions into your household cleaning products and sweeping out the negative energy with it, you know, washing it out and, uh, you know, rubbing in the good energy. So that's a very, it's been a long time since I've done that one myself, so I'm not describing it very well, but if you look up on Lucky Mojo, they have all sorts of information about how to do a wash and that's something that we all have to do right like um cleaning our space so imbuing everything that we do so some of the greatest witchiness happens right while cooking dinner like imbuing that with intention and love as you're making the food that you're going to eat that you're going to feed your family um Another really fun thing people in my, um, a lot of folks in my magic course enjoy is making honey jars. So a really simple love spell is like to write out your name on a piece of paper a few times, or I'm sorry, write out your intended beloved's name on a piece of paper a few times, write your name crossed over it a few times, put that in a jar start pouring some honey over it. You probably also want to include like some cinnamon and ginger for some sexy spice. 
um, pray, you know, invoke whatever spiritual allies you want to invoke, light a candle on top of that honey jar, and see how it sweetens your relations with that person. Um, and talk about the ethics of it, Kathleen. That's interesting. And, and I think um, there's a lot... Whenever people talk about, like, oh, I shouldn't interfere with somebody else's will magically, I'm like, yeah, except that's what humans do all the time, every second of every day, every time we talk to each other. You know, like, we're constantly influencing. So yeah. the ethics of influence, like, you know, if I want... there, I wouldn't put out something on somebody to you know to hurt them just because I wouldn't I don't take physical violence against people or whatever I, if I don't hurt then I don't try to hurt but if I, tr I try to sweeten my relations all the damn time with people right so doing that magically doesn't really seem to be any different for me so whatever ethics I apply to whatever other actions I apply so you know having your son right. sleep like uh so also there's this idea in hoodoo, which I find very fascinating, which is this notion that nothing can happen that's not God's will anyways. Like hoodoo is a Christian-based system of magic, and the idea is that everything that occurs is God's will. Nothing that can happen is outside of it, whether we like it or not, whether it shocks us or not. So any kind of magic can't happen unless, you know, God, the creator, agrees to it happening. And the idea is that we are active, you know, it's a little bit new agey and dorky, but active co-creators um, with God or the universe. Can we dig into that a little bit? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Because I'm just like, my, I just, sometimes I feel like that is, maybe this is my ego talking, the part of me that identifies with the unconscious sleepiness or whatever. And I'm definitely very spiritual, but... Whenever it comes to God's will and kind of like predestination, I just, I feel like it can sometimes be an excuse for good and bad things. Like, oh, this great thing happened, praise God. And that's good too. But like this terrible thing happened, oh, God must have not wanted me to have money or God must have not wanted me to have true love. You know, whatever that might look like it just to me feels a little bit like a cop-out at times I don't know I don't know how I feel I'm fumbling like I'm I'm wrestling with that a little bit no I I, I know exactly what I, I know where you're going with this and the idea that using God as an excuse to keep you from taking responsibility for yourself I think and I think it, is that what you're talking yeah that's I mean I'm kind of about. going back <laughs> no exactly kind of going back to that um, having is evidence of wanting, right? So, and maybe there is, and maybe, maybe whenever I'm thinking that there's kind of this, the concept that nothing could happen without God's will, I'm still thinking of it in my conditioning growing up as the man in the sky, kind of saying, yes, you, not you, versus kind of a more butterfly effect algorithm that's more of like a, just a hum underlying everything but you know what I mean like there could be lots of different things going through like layered in that are bringing me to have this very ineloquent rambling about what this means <laughs> but <laughs> but it's so important it's so important and yeah. it's and it's at the heart of how we imagine ourselves and how we imagine our creativity actually right like creation is that's what god or whatever you know that's what we're doing so um, so, so important. And the thing is, is that most people are just theologically boring. So I don't like to say that they're wrong. They could be right on a certain <laughs> level. Uh, all I know is that it, I find it boring. So, um, so when I ask myself, well, what's interesting? What's, what stirs my imagination? What creates in me that feeling of resonance and, and unconcealment and truth is unveiling? Well, so, and, and obviously, like, oh, I, I mean, I love this question. We could talk about it forever. The interplay between the indi our individual will and the will of the divine. Great topic forever. Um, <laughs> but one, something that I find interesting about it is, um, so going back to the analogy I was talking about earlier about this being a dream. And so in this dream that I'm usually having, 
I usually think of myself as this character called Carolyn, who has like curly hair and a preference for red lipstick. Um, and that's who I usually think I am, right? But I'm not this dream character. I'm the dreamer. So the dreamer is dreaming me, the dream character, Carolyn, and beautiful Kathleen and Emily, all the listeners out there, all the trees and the frogs and the puppy dog tails and the terrorist attacks and the horrible disease and the pain and the suffering in the world. It's all in there. And as much as, you know, it could be uh, in a certain way like comforting or sweet to imagine um, a god that conforms to my human standards of benevolence, that just doesn't seem to be what's happening. Like, there's, uh, you know, the dreamer of the dream seems to enjoy the wars and the nightmares and the pain and the grief and the illness and the death. I mean, we all die. None of us get out of this alive. Um, so the dreamer seems to like that just as much as Christmas and puppies. So <laughs> there's a way... I think... I think what I'm hearing you say is that you are not necessarily Carolyn in this dream, which you said is an analogy, but I think it's pretty much not. Right, it's not. (laughs) Okay, so you, like, who you really are, like, that I am is the dreamer, which is a part of the bigger dream which is so so essentially maybe the free will i i and i didn't mean to go here either but whenever it comes to free will and individuality um if you are of god and i'm using god for lack of better words whatever you want to call it if you are of god and of source then your will is that of source and vice versa like the lines are actually much more blurry than you being a puppet on strings yes ma'am exactly okay I like that. I can I can kind of grasp my head around that. Like, I am not the puppet on strings. I am the puppeteer. Right, but you're not completely the puppeteer, right? So, like... I know, like, there's, like, another... Yes. Yeah, so this is where it's complicated and interesting. So, like, you, the dream character Kathleen, are part of the dreamer and in touch... And the dreamer hears you, right? Like, your, your spells, your prayers are heard because... It is you. You are, you, it's you. So, um, but at the same time, the dreamer is not just the dream character, Kathleen, or the dream character, Carolyn. So whereas the dream character, Carolyn, over here, you know, like I might want, let's say I want a billion dollars to arrive on my doorstep somehow t- tomorrow. Um, the rest of the dream may be doing other stuff. It may be just like, not that much interested in giving me a billion dollars tomorrow because it has other interesting dream things that it's doing. Um, so there's this way, but but then again, I can also do a spell and make some other stuff happen. Like I, I did an uncrossing spell recently, so to uncross some bad luck and my luck improved. So there's there's these ways in which it is responsive. It's utterly responsive. And yet it's also this, well... Maybe I'm getting abstract here too, but it is this like amazing tapestry that's happening. So there's an interplay. And I think the whole point of the dream is to realize that I am, is to lose my identity with this dream character who is bound to die, who is, you know, I'm bound to lose my amazing good looks. And slowly, you know, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll rot, I'll be in the ground like everybody else. Um, I don't, Carolyn doesn't like that idea. That sounds like a shitty idea to me. Um... But, you know, I think the whole process of being alive is learning to identify with that larger dreamer and not just me. So that's, yeah. Ooh. (laughs) Well, one of the things that you said in this article that blew my mind that I keep talking about is, and I think it, it applies to so many things that we've been talking about today, is that your capacity to live in paradox is your capacity for real success, power, influence, and joy. Mm. So, and I feel like creative entrepreneurs of all people really need to hear this and understand it, that everything we're doing is such a paradox, you know, being afraid to create and then creating anyway. And 
um, just in spirituality and business, all of it um, is a huge paradox. When that none I'm, of it makes sense, basically, <laughs> none of it makes sense, and that's and being okay with that. Mm. Um, and that's what I'm on a path to do, and just enjoying being on that path, and yeah, all of it. So. Um, okay, Carolyn, Emily, do you have any other questions or things that you want to, you're going to have to come back on the show. Yeah, I'm going to have to re-listen to this episode. Sure. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, we might just have to fly out to Bali for a Bean Boss retreat. Yes, please. (laughs) Yes. Oh my God, I know some good (laughs) retreat centers. We could make this happen. Anyways, yes. All right, so let's put some magic in place to make that happen. We can all do a spell on it and see what see how soon we can manifest that. Um, where can people learn more about you? Like, just tell us where we can find you, how we can join your Practical Magic e-course workshop. Mm-hmm. Totally. <laughs> Kathleen will be there. But I, I need to know for myself. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so on my website, Bad Witches, badwitch.es, because it's clever like that. Um, there are little forms to sign up for my email list, my specifically magically oriented email list. So I have two different email lists. So there's that one. So if you are specifically interested in the magic class, Influence, which will open for registration again on January 16th, my birthday, um, go there, make sure you're on that email list and, you know, make sure you do the whole thing where you drag my initial email into your inbox and not, don't let it just languish in your promotions tab where you'll miss it so uh that and then if you're also interested in other things that i do like my writing for the social web course i'm a damn good writing teacher and i will show you how to get your stuff virally shared um so for example that essay that you like kathleen i mean i think it was shared over five thousand times which is pretty pretty solid so i can show you how to do that um and the place where you you can sign up from my email list at my personal website, carolyngraceelliot.com. So Bad Witches is a magazine, and I'm also always looking for submissions about magical life and about, you know, um, awesome things in general. So there's information about how to submit to the magazine on there, too. So if you're a writer or if you are just an awesome boss and you want to promote your stuff by writing articles for Bad Witches, it's a great way to promote yourself. Anyways, write for me. So, right for us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> me, me, me. Um, so, yes, carolyngraceelliot.com and badwitch.es. Sign up for my mailing lists, and that's how you'll find out about my offerings. And I am on a mailing list where I got a series of autoresponders that talked about kind of your rags to riches story. Which list is that? That is on both of them. Okay, so you should sign up. Like someone in the Facebook group asked me, they were like, describe to me or have someone on that is not married, doesn't have kids. Like I need to know someone who's really done it on their own. And I was like, well, from what I've read so far, Carolyn did a pretty bang up job doing that. So that's like a really good story too. And I love the way that it unfolds. And I kind of already know who Fu is because you introduce him to us there. So I'm really excited to hear your guys's podcast in G- Is it launching in January? It is also right around my birthday. Yeah, he's about to fly here to Bali. So I'm excited. I've been missing him. He's been in Pittsburgh and he's like my best pal, guy pal. So yeah. Wait, wait is he a honey jar? Um, so there is deep magical secrecy. (laughs) No, Fu Fu and I, um, I mean, uh, so first of all, I want all of the other eligible bachelors out there who may be listening to this, uh, know that I am single and I am open to (laughs) wonderful true love. And also, we have great guy listeners. Yeah, and being boss. Like I feel like a lot of people think it's all about girl bosses, but we've got some guys listening. So yeah, so gentlemen, I am single. Uh, hit me up. You can find my Facebook profile. Anyways, uh, but Fu and I, we do have this Mulder and Scully dynamic in which I am Mulder, and uh, <laughs> I mean it's hilarious. Like I find it hilarious. Um, And, you know, we have, like, a really productive uh, platonic partnership. 
So, so, so you'll like jump the shark basically if you end up hooking up. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> and that so that shark cannot be jumped for at least like seven years because there's a whole media empire to be built. So. That's where we are with that. So you just need to enjoy that if there is that molar scully tension there. Just mm-hmm. enjoy that. Exactly. Um, so people always ask me who, like, how I got the name Fox for my son, and it's actually after Fox Molar on X Files. <laughs> I don't tell many people that, but that's <laughs> that's it. And I'm not like a huge X Files fan but i don't know i want to believe you want to we want to believe i want to believe i want fox to believe (laughs) right um okay well thank you so much i this is not goodbye because we're going to have you back but thank you for spending so much time with us and we will include links to everything in the show notes and we'll be sure to holler at you once the episode goes live ah thank you my pleasure for joining us Thank you for listening to Being Boss. Find show notes for this episode at lovebeingboss.com. Listen to past episodes and subscribe to new episodes on our website, on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. Did you like this episode? Head on over to our Facebook group by searching Being Boss on Facebook and join in on the conversation with other bosses or share it with a friend. Do the work, be boss, and we'll see you next week. All right, stop recording now, Corey. Um, Thank you. (laughs) Like, I I always feel like I have to say thank you twice. (laughs) Right. So this is the real, this is the non-recorded real thank you. Yeah. (laughs) But also, do you know how I know you're our boss girlfriend? You're the first person to ever use the podcast to get a boyfriend. (laughs) (laughs) You just solidified your place in boss girlfriendum because you did a shout out to all the single fellas. (laughs) 